So it's a great pleasure to introduce um, Ruslan, Ruslan um, Saluk-Tudinov, who is um, a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, um, and right now uh, one of the leading figures in deep learning. Um, he's a product of the deep learning um, um, of Toronto, University of Toronto, which has produced um, some amazing uh, figures. And uh, well, uh, Ruslan was a professor there, and then went on to do his uh, postdoc at, um, at we met at MIT, and, we're, and now he's a professor at CMU, and a Sloan Fellow and Microsoft Fellow there. So really looking forward to his talk. Thank you. Uh, let's see if I'm uh, connecting and I can get this. Am I connecting? Like a button that I need to switch? Oh, OK, she's, OK, great. So let's see if, uh, if that works. OK, great. Um, well, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, inviting me to give a talk. So I'd like to talk today about neural map, which is a structured memory for deep reinforcement learning, and sort of go over the areas of, of uh, memory. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a background, and then uh, uh, show a specific model, which we view as a very simple model, but has a few interesting properties. And uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll show you some of uh, uh, examples of using memory in languages, uh, particularly incorporating prior knowledge with, with memory. So as you know that we've seen a lot of successes in supervised learning, right? In fact, most of the deep learning algorithms are, you know, successes are coming from basically mapping inputs to the outputs. And if we look at the supervised learning, traditional supervised learning, the environment is typically static. And um, uh, typically, the outputs I assume to be independent of uh, one another, right? So labeling one image doesn't really impact the other one. And when we look at reinforcement learning environments, the environments are typically dynamic. They change over time. Actions can infect the environment uh, with arbitrary time lags, right? So for example, if you do an action today, it can really impact your, uh, uh, if you take a particular action today, you know, it can really impact your, your, your future reward. Uh, labels can be, expensive, can be very expensive or very difficult to get. So think about you know, trying to uh, get uh, the right actuations of a swimming octopus. Right? How do you get labels for that? That's pretty challenging. And reinforcement learning essentially allows us uh, uh, to work in that environment. It's, uh, in itself, reinforcement learning is kind of a very old field. Um, uh, so instead of a label, uh, an agent is given, is provided with a reward signal. So high reward basically means good behavior. And if you think about reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning essentially produces policies, right? You can think of the policies as mapping from observations to actions. And with the goal of maximizing some long-term reward. Um, now, what happens in the space of deep reinforcement learning, sort of one, one, one slide here, is that we're essentially using deep neural networks to parameterize the policy, right? So our input could be a high dimensional uh, input and then we're using deep neural nets and the output of a deep neural network is an action. Um, and we adapt parameters to maximize overall rewards using Q learning, actor critic. Uh, there's been a lot of work that I'm listing here uh, that sort of uh, looks at all of these different uh, algorithms, evolution strategies, which is, you know, akin to doing finite differences method. Uh, but let me show you one particular example of uh, a, a reinforcement learning agent learning to play a 3D uh, game. And this is without memory, and this is the work uh, of uh, Chaplot and Lampler uh, a year ago. So what you're seeing here is um, the input to the environment is just a 2D image, right, which is a frame. And the output is the action, move left, move right, go forward. And um, the rewards that you're getting here is just collecting objects. And uh, what you can see is that you're not really telling the agent how to navigate in the environment, you're just telling the, uh, the agent collect as many objects as possible. Right? And so through the process of learning, basically after a couple of hours of training across multiple GPUs, the, the agent basically learns to move around in this 3D environment, which is you know, pretty, um, pretty impressive. And it's, a, it's a simple environment, as you can see, but it has no problem you know, navigating in, in, uh, uh, in that environment. You can train with random textures. This is an example of just having a very diverse set of environments. And what's interesting is that once you do that, if you actually show the agent a new environment, uh, a new map, or, or you can think of it as, as an environment that the model has never seen before at the training time, then it has no problems navigating in this new environment. So here you're navigating in an unknown map, um, right? And so the textures are somewhat different, the, 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 the structure of the map is different, 
and the model has no problems moving around. Um, so that's, that's interesting. But the problem with a lot of these techniques so far is that these models are reactive, right? Given an input, you take an action. Given another input, you take another action. Um, the question is, can we learn agents uh, with a more advanced external memory, right? Something that, so, so that we can remember what happened in the past so that we can act optimally in the future. And there's been wonderful work uh, coming out of Alex Graves and his colleagues at DeepMind on neural Turing machines and differentiable, uh, differential neural computers. It's actually is designed, uh, they are designing these, these um, uh, external memory modules. Um, one of the big challenges is uh, it's very difficult to learn uh, these systems. Particularly, it's very difficult to learn memory uh, systems, especially using reinforcement learning objectives, right? So that's, that's a big challenge. Now, why memory is challenging? Suppose I give you a very simple example. Um, suppose agent starts at a particular location in the map, and then you give an agent an indicator somewhere near the initial state, and then the color of the indicator or the state of the indicator determines what is the correct goal or where the agent should go, right? So in this case, if the indicator is green, you have to find the red target. If the indicator is blue, you have to find the cyan tar target, right? If you look at this particular formulation, I mean, it's, it's very simple for us to understand what the problem is. It's extremely difficult for machines to figure out, uh, 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 to solve this problem, right? Obviously, if I tell you a priori, if, and, uh, if this, do that, or if you see something else, you do that, then the problem is easy. The real question is, at the start, uh, in these examples, there is no a priori knowledge about the color of the indicator, right? And the time that can take between when you see the indicator and, and finding the right target could be, you know, arbitrarily long, right? So standard models like uh, a lot of people are looking at recurrent networks, long-term short-term memory, LSTM models, and, and stuff, uh, uh, models of that sort, they generally fail in these tasks, all right? So in order to solve this task, the following must hold. You have to write uh, the color to the memory at the start of the maze. You can never overwrite the memory over the next t time steps as you're exploring the environment, and you have to find the right target. Right? So how can we do that? One solution that we've seen so far is basically writing everything into memory. Um, right? And uh, in particular in the space of language um, understanding, there has been a lot of work on memory networks. And you can think about memory networks as just basically storing the representations of what you see uh, of the last M frames, and at every single time step, you perform something called a read operation, which is essentially doing an attention uh, over what you've stored, um, and you write your latest percept into the memory. Right. So you're just basically storing what you see. Now that's easy to learn because you're basically trying to store as much as possible. Right. One option would be to store the whole history and then try to retrieve uh, uh, the relevant pieces. Uh, but it can be inefficient, right? Because you need to store uh, a lot of information, and some of that information might not be very useful. Uh, in fact, you're going to be storing a lot of useless information, a lot of redundant information. Um, and obviously, there is a time and space requirements uh, increase with how much you're willing to store. So can we do something else? Let me show you one very simple idea. So here, what we are going to do is we're going to uh, uh, create a, a location-aware memory. Um, you can think of it as a memory with a very specific inductive bias. We're going to structure the memory into a grid of k-dimensional cells. So think of k-dimensional cells as representing features of what we're seeing, and uh, w by w representing the map that we're exploring. And for every x, y position, we're going to be writing to x prime, y prime position inside uh, uh, of our, uh, our memories. So obviously, there has to be mapping. So I'm making a couple of assumptions here. One assumption is I'm making here is that I know my position in the environment, which in many cases could be an unreasonable assumption, but I'm going to uh, uh, show you how we can get around that. So for now, let's assume that we know where we are in the environment. And so if we're in this environment, what we're observing, we're storing it in the memory. If we're in a different location, uh, and so depending on where we are, we are uh, uh, storing at that particular location. So effectively, the map acts as a, uh, as a map that basically agent fills out as it explores the environment. And we have sparse writing operations, right, because we only need to write at one particular location. Um, and it allows us for easy credit assignment problem over time. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. 
Um, so the overall architecture uh, looks like this. You're given some state, you create some feature, you write it into the memory, you take an action. Given an action, the environment changes, you read from the memory the information, the necessary information, um, you update your memory, and then you take another action, and so forth. Right? So you can think of the memory as this, this very structured two-dimensional, in this case three-dimensional block, that you update at every single time step. Um, let me quickly show you the underlying um, uh, architecture that, that we've, we've implemented. There's obviously a whole bunch of different things you can do, but this is what we've done. Uh, there are two operations, two read operations. There's something called global summarization, and then there's context-based retrieval. There's a sparse write operation. We're writing only at a specific agent location. And then we're using both of these vectors, both of these representations, to compute the policy, to compute what the next action should be. Okay? So the global read operation, you can think of it as looking at the summary of, uh, uh, of what's happening in our memory. So this is just a convolutional neural network that essentially just produces a vector that provides a global summary of what we've seen so far. Um, the next operation is a context uh, read operation, um, which is summarized by a set of equations, but I'm going to explain what they are using attention. This is what we call a very standard attention mechanism. So let me give you an intuition of what it does. Um, imagine that I'm looking at a very simple 2 by D memory. Um, this is illustrated here. And I have some embedding of the state and my global summary. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a dot product between the query vector, which is my state, and every memory cell to produce a similarity score alpha. Now I can take these alphas, I pass them through softmax and normalize, so these alphas are normalized, they sum up to one. Um, and then I uh, take a dot product with uh, overall memory, a sum of all positions to get a context read vector C sub T. Okay. The intuition behind these operation is basically you're trying to find a vector or retrie uh, retrieve uh, a vector C sub T from the memory that's closest to your query vector. And that's essentially what the attention operation does. It's you know, a very standard read operation. A um, couple of caveats. Why am I doing all of these things? The reason why I'm doing all of these things is that the entire operations here are, are differentiable, which basically means that I can backpropagate through these operations. Now, there are some um, uh, advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that you can backprop. The disadvantages is that you have to look at every single location in your memory, which could be computationally intensive. So there's a lot of work people are now trying to figure out. There's something that's called hard attention, which is you're only retrieving uh, uh, you know, a few locations, or there is a hierarchical softmax type of representation. So there's some work of people trying to uh, basically speed it up. Um, but that's, that's one caveat. Um, in terms of the writing operation, we basically create a k-dimensional vector. Uh, what we're seeing in the environment, and basically update the neural map uh, using the uh, context, what, what, using our observation, right? So given uh, a particular representation, then we just update our uh, neural map. Uh, we're also looking at gating, which allows us to not to update the context of the map. This is a standard, again, practice to basically say, well, depending on the environment and your hidden state, you might not update, and it depends on, on, on the gating mechanism. And then we basically take the context, uh, we basically take the read vectors and the write vectors and use those features to compute a policy, right? So that's, that's sort of, uh, uh, and again, if I look at the sequence of all of these operations, this entire sequence is differentiable. So we're basically going to be learning what to write, uh, how to read, and all the parameters of, of, uh, uh, of the model. Let me show you a couple of examples. Um, so here's an example in two-dimensional environment, and this is what the input state looks like, right? So the input state is partially observable. That's the only thing that I'm seeing. Um, and we also tested, you know, the, the results are robust with a small noise in the XY position. Um, but here's what the model does. Let me just explain what, what the model does. So here, you know, you are testing the system on a completely random maze. So this is something that the model has never seen at the training time. Um, the indicator that you're seeing here, the pink indicator, basically means that the agent should go to the green block. Right. That was the task. And uh, this is what the agent does. It moves around in this environment. It actually stumbles across the wrong target. 
it retrieves from the memory the information that it has, backtracks, and through the sequence again of exploration, eventually finds the right target. Right. So this is an example of uh, you know where you uh, a model that was able to store um, the state of the indicator to learn to store the state of the indicator and then figure out that these are sort of rules in the environment that you have to follow. Um, again, a priori, we're not telling the system that there is something that's called indicator. So the system, through the learning, decides what it needs to store and how it needs to read so that it doesn't go to the wrong target. This is uh, a setting in a 3D environment. Um, this is, again, just an example of, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you start with a, a green indicator, so you have to find the green target. So it moves around the red target. Does, it knows that if you hit the red target, you get negative reward. It moves around, it explores the space up until it finds the correct target and just basically goes to the correct target. Um, so uh, another uh, interesting environment that, uh, that we tested is something called uh, Minota Maze. So this is an example where I start at a particular target here. I explore the space up until I find the red target. Once I find the red target, I want to be able to return back to my original uh, 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 to the green target as fast as possible, right? So again, this is tested in a completely random environment. So the agent kind of moves around. It's it's exploring the space. Um, this is a random maze. Was never trained on this maze. So it, uh, and obviously you can see it's a little bit of a challenging environment because the walls look, you know, very similar. Up until it um, eventually stumbles across um, the. Um, the red target. Um, once it finds the red target, it reaches the red target. Its goal now is to reach the green target as fast as possible. Right? So it kind of has to figure out how to move around in order to reach back the original target. Um, so eventually it goes and, and, and gets there. Right. So this is sort of another example where the memory is, is, is important because, again, you have to remember something about the environment so you can come back to, uh, uh, to the original state. Now, one of the problems, as I mentioned before, with neural map is that it requires mapping. Right? It requires us to know what the position, where we are. Um, so we need to have already solved localization. Right? So one way around it is to get a map which is egocentric. So the, the agent always writes to the center of the map, and when the agent moves, the entire map basically moves in the opposite amount. Right? So this is something that we've tried uh, as well. It actually works much better than the original uh, uh, model if we just look at uh, uh, from the egocentric point of view. And obviously, um, we can try to solve localization problem as well. And there's been some work that Devendra was talking about looking at active neural localization, that you can combine both of these approaches. Some of the results, it's, the numbers themselves are not important. What's interesting, what I'd like to point out is that, you know, even in smaller mazes, when we go to eight by eight mazes, you can see that it's become still a very challenging task. In order, you know, being, being able to uh, uh, solve both of these tasks is, is still challenging, right? Especially if you go into completely random environments or, or random maps that you've never seen before. Uh, in a minota task, when you have to you know, find the shortest path from your target back to your original uh, uh, um, sort of where you've started, you can see that the numbers are pretty low. We're hitting like 40% you know, accuracy. So, so again, it highlights that there's still a lot of room for, um, for improvement. Now, in the last five minutes, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you that memory, the notion of memory is not just seen in the context of reinforcement learning, but also in the context of language understanding. So we've been looking at the settings where if I give you some textual representation, is there any way you can combine some of your prior knowledge about you know, dependency parsers, entity relations, word relations, and combine both of these representations to get a much better representation of text? Uh, Traditional systems today are using recurrent neural networks and they're very much data driven, right? Without actually being uh, uh, incorporating prior knowledge. Let me show you an example of why this is useful. Imagine I give you the sequence of sentences. Mary got the football, she went to the kitchen, she left the ball there. This is coming from uh, um, something called baby, baby AI data set. I can build an RNN, but then I can also use co-references or I can also use synonyms. 
um, right? And so that information now is very valuable for us to create um, a much more advanced systems where we can use the states of what we've seen before as memory um, uh, to update the states as, as we go through uh, recurrent neural networks. So there's a special, I don't have time to go through the, uh, the, the, the mechanics of it, but there is a special way is again augmenting that representation with the hidden states of recurrent neural networks and, and uh, incorporate that. Let me show you an example of where it can help us. Um, imagine that I give you a question, and the question is, how many objects is Sandra carrying? And on the left side, you're basically seeing a whole bunch of sentences. Sandra went to the hallway. Um, Sandra grabbed the apple there. Daniel moved to the kitchen. Sandra got the milk there. And after every single sentence, you're using the model to predict how many objects is Sandra carrying. And you can see that in traditional models, in fact, here we've used something called gated attention reader, which is the state-of-the-art model for question answering, for reading comprehension tasks. The model is basically saying one all the time. And the reason why is because if I ask you the question, how many objects somebody is carrying, if I always say one, I'm going to you know, get like 99% accuracy because most of the time people are carrying one object. And then basically model figures it out and it always says one, no matter what the, what, what the question is. Um, and here is the system that actually incorporates the memory as it goes through the sequence of sentences. Uh, so it starts basically with none, and then Sandra grabbed the apple there. It understands that Sandra is now carrying one object. Then there is a little bit of confusion when Daniel moved to the kitchen, and then Sandra, you know, uh, get the milk there, then you know that it's two. So uh, again, these kinds of systems are helping us quite substantially on, on a number of data sets to, to Im really improve uh, the, the, uh, uh, the question answering task. Ultimately, you know, can we build agents, intelligent agents that can have the external memory? Because I think it's really, really important to have uh, uh, that mechanism in place. And it's not something that you're just storing in the weights of a neural network, right? Traditionally, if you look at convolutional networks or recurrent networks, all information is stored in the weights. Um, but there's, uh, when you have an external memory, you're actually storing information. And you're learning what to store, and you're learning how to read as well as reasoning and communication. So I just wanted to highlight one particular uh, example of learning to execute instructions. Um, so here's an example of, of uh, a model um, where we're basically saying, go to the short pillar, and the agent is trying to figure out what does it mean. You get the reward if you hit the right target, and you get negative reward if you don't hit the right target. And this is, you know, to some extent, it's a little baby st step. Uh, towards language grounding. Obviously, this is a very constrained environment where we don't have a lot of instructions. But at the same time, the model eventually is learning what does it mean to go to the tall red object, right? Or what does it mean to go to the smallest blue object um, without uh, uh, just basically going through the uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Um, and eventually, after lots and lots of training, it's learning you know, things like what does it mean the tall, what's blue, uh, and obviously, we're testing in the settings where, or, or on the combination of words that don't really, we, we haven't seen at the training time. So these are really well-defined test protocols. Uh, and the underlying model, if you think about the model, is that you know, there is a pathway which takes the language. There is a pathway that takes image. There is something that's called gated um, uh, multimodal fusion, which is you know, a special way of combining both of these representations. And then you compute the policy. What is your next action you need to take? Right, and this is work that was done by Chaplot, uh, uh, Devander Chaplot. And I also want to highlight there was uh, uh, another paper also coming out of DeepMind at about the same time that's also trying to address uh, uh, a similar problem, understanding language grounding. I think it's uh, 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 a really, really exciting and very important uh, uh, work. So on that note, just a little bit of discussion. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to extend this work into multi-agent domains, right? Can we actually get multiple agents communicating through shared memory uh, as we explore the environment? And, and you know, can we write to the same memory so that both or multiple agents can, can decide to act uh, uh, optimally? Can we train an agent that can learn how to simultaneously localize and map its environment? And, and again, you've seen a little bit of that in the previous talk by Devendra on active neural localization. But we're also trying to figure out how can we go into active slam problem? How do we solve localization and mapping um, in an active way, right? How do we take the right action so that we can quickly localize and map the environment? 
and it solves the problem of needing an oracle to supply x, y position. And also, we're also looking how can we structure neural maps into multi-scale hierarchy. Right? Because right now, it's fairly expensive. When we do the read operation, we have to touch every single location in the map. Um, but perhaps there are other ways uh, you can do it by looking at the multi-scale uh, hierarchy and multi-scale uh, representation. So on that note, thank you very much. And I guess if there is time for questions, I don't know if there is time, but uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, quick question, does the memory support um, like hierarchical objects? Let's say Sandra has a basket of apples or a basket of toy cars and each car has four wheels. So how many wheels is she carrying? So uh, uh, can you repeat the question? What do you mean like a car has four wheels and... and so basically originally the query was how many objects does she have? Uh, what if the objects are kind of nested and then it's a object that contains other objects, which contains maybe some more. So in the case of, of question answering, or in general, that, that becomes uh, fairly difficult. I agree with you that can you build hierarchical uh, uh, structures? Yes, absolutely. Um, and then in the case of question answering, if you look at language, one of the biggest problems right now is, is what I've shown you, that, that you know, the sentences, they're very simple. They're almost like templates. If you go to the space where you're actually dealing with real text, textual data, then the question is, can you actually reason about objects? Can you reason about what agents are doing in the environment? And that gets to the next level. Um, and that's very difficult to do at this stage. Um, I think that there's been some work, um, particularly combining deep learning and, and, and question answering or reading comprehension that goes beyond just simple pattern recognition. Uh, and it's trying to, using attention mechanisms as well as incorporating some prior knowledge, as I mentioned, looking at core references so that you can, word relations, so that you can do a little bit of reasoning um, to be able to answer these, these types of questions. Uh, but we're still, you know, very far from uh, dealing with these kinds of environments in, 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 uh, in an open domain question answering open domain question answering environments. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. If you have a visualization of the two-dimensional neural map of the trajectory of the tension. Yeah, so actually there is a poster here and there is a visualization. So I should have put it in the slide. So what happens with a 2D visualization? What happens in the environment where the agent goes to the wrong target? If you actually visualize what the attention does, the attention very precisely look, you know, uh, attends to the indicator because that's the only thing that matters. Um, so it learns to attend to the right part in the environment and it learns to store um, the particular indicator, even though a priori, we don't tell the system that there's something that's called indicator. So the way you can think about the model learning is that you throw the model in the random environment, the agent moves around, stumbles across red target, gets positive reward. Now that's a reinforce. You say, well, maybe red targets, I should go to the red targets. Next time you hit the red target, you get negative reward. Um, right, and so through the process of learning, you're essentially discovering these almost like causal mechanisms, that there is something in the environment that causes you to either get positive reward or get negative reward. Um, the, 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 the challenge is that if the time between you see the time that you see the indicator and you find the right target could be very large, and this is a very no, well-known problem as a long-term dependency task. And so, very when nice. we look at these larger-scale environments, it's you know traditional LSTMs, RNNs, it's just they just don't work. Um, there's no way for them to remember that far in the past. Uh, but we do see that the model learns the right representation of the memory and it does attend to the right parts when it's making a decision of which, uh, which target to go to or like to backtrack, don't hit the target, actually take an action, move back and, and, and explore somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Oh. I don't know if we have... Hello. 
uh, in a demo, there are mazes as an environment where you risk following. But have you tried to extend the boundaries of mazes, not just the texture change or uh, light, but actually a forest, for instance? Because eventually it's going to the left, going to the right, going up and down. But the indicators are probably slightly different. It's the frequency of the trees or hills and, uh, I don't know, valleys, stuff like that. So, I oh. don't know, maybe it's done. Uh, it just wasn't present in a demo. So, 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 so do you mean like looking at more realistic environments? Is, is, is your question is like try to look at not, more? Not quite a very different environment, but still have the, the environment that has a notion of a maze. Forest, very, very dense forest. Yeah, so we... we Basically, yeah, so we've tried, we, we right now are trying to look at Unreal Engine environments uh, and trying to navigate in something, you know, a little bit more photorealistic. But to be honest, we're struggling with getting the right environment because there aren't a lot of open source environments that we can work with. Um, particularly like Doom environment is one environment where it's very easy to operate on because it's, the API was written uh, there. Um, we're looking at Unreal Engine, but it's pretty challenging because it, you know, it fails, it doesn't, uh, so there's, there's, right now we're just missing uh, uh, having a really uh, uh, good, basically good simulation environments. Obviously there are a few ones that are coming up, uh, so we're exploring those, but um, yeah. Well, the reason is a lot of people are struggling with the same thing. So you have a yeah. weak spatial memory, right? So what if there is a latent structure exist for yeah. spatial memory. Yeah, yeah. So there is there, there are obviously like there are obviously hierarchical extensions mm -hmm. that we're also thinking about. Um, um, and can you learn that hierarchical representation so that you can just yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but we haven't uh, I don't think at this point we have any sort of results that can that I can show. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Russ for a great talk. Uh, maybe I could just ask one last question. Uh, which is, do you think there's something inherently um, effective about a two-dimensional memory structure, even in environments that don't have uh, two-dimensional spatial structure themselves? Yeah, so, you, so, so you're thinking like, um, uh, that's a good question, I don't know. I mean, obviously, like if you, if you have a drone that flies around, maybe you want to have a three-dimensional sort of representation, but ultimately, or do you go to the continuous, uh, 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 some kind of a continuous representation of, of your memory, I don't know. Right now, the reason why we've chosen a discrete structure is because the writing operation is very precise. We don't need to do distributed writing, uh, what we've seen in neural Turing machines. Um, and that helps us a lot, right? By putting this inductive bias, we can actually start solving these. And even right now, solving these tasks in these simplistic environments is still extremely hard. It takes a very long time to learn these associations in, in a 3D environment. So it's not, it's not easy. So I think that um, it's, it's a good question, but ultimately I think that the notion of I mean, writing is if you know your XY position or XYZ position and you know your pose, you know, if you could solve uh, a pose uh, estimation problem, then you know maybe perhaps where to write. But reading becomes expensive because, you know, if you want to have a differentiable operation. So we are trying to also think about other discrete attention mechanisms so that we don't have to, you know, uh, uh, do the reading operation, just touching the entire memory, but, but we haven't been successful so far. Because as soon as you have discrete choices to make, that adds another complexity, right? It's through some reinforce, and then it becomes even more difficult to train. Um, so we haven't been successful there yet. Okay. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Let's make this the last question. <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. <clears throat> I um, I was I was um, thinking about Maybrit Musser's work on neuroscience with uh, place cells and such. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering whether you are inspired by this work, and also if orientation is a part of this neuro neural map. Yes, that's that's a good question. Yes, we are um, we are inspired by uh, the place cells, obviously, because. Um, um, we haven't really done a very strong connection to that work. I mean, right now we're just thinking about um, we just we're thinking about how do we set up the problem. 
so that we can at least try to solve it in these very simplistic tasks, which again is very difficult for us to, to, uh, to solve. Um, Yeah, I think I think that there is, needs to be a little bit more work with uh, you know connections to neuroscience because I know it's it's uh, uh, the other thing is is um, uh, we're also trying to s basically figure out can we take these kinds of uh, algorithms and try to solve SLAM or active SLAM? How do you take actions so that you can localize and map the environment as quickly as possible? Um, yeah, so these are, these are things that we're looking, we, we sort of, we're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's, it, it, so, so, so one of, again, and, and another area that we're trying to look at is how can we design optimization algorithms so that we can learn in these environments faster? One of the challenges right now is we're running these environments across multiple GPUs, we're training them for, you know, many, many hours before we can sort of get some, to some reasonable level of performance. And as you've seen from the results, we're not hitting 100% accuracy. We're sort of hitting 40%, uh, which basically means that we're not solving these tasks as well as we could, could be solving them. So there is something, you know, difficult. We're doing better than traditional models like RNNs and LSTMs and just storing things, the past frames. What you've seen, that, that doesn't work well either. Thank you. Sure. Perhaps, perhaps orientation could be a key. Uh, uh, so the relationship to the, the orientation. Oh, the orientation. Sorry. Yeah. So orientation is actually very important for us. Right now, for this work, we kind of ignored it, which is really bad because if I'm looking here versus if I'm looking here, I'm in the same location, but these two things are very different. Um, but we are now looking, again, at, at uh, active neural localization where we're actually looking at orientation. There's a follow-up work that will probably come up very soon, which is going to be looking at uh, is estimating continuous orientation. So continuous position and continuous orientation. So that comes to more of a pose estimation, a global pose estimation, which is very challenging problem, like doing from it in Unreal Engine or looking at more realistic environments. So, Thanks. I guess.